Uh, Mark Maynard. Paul Maynard, I beg your pardon. Paul Maynard. Well, I'm Deputy Speaker. It's a pleasure to speak in this debate, and I've listened carefully to all the contributions so far. And I've been struck by the efforts of various speakers to try to better understand what is going on at the moment by finding some frame of historical reference to link it to. Is it more like 1989, 1956, 1918, 1848, 1789, 1453? It's a very tempting game to play. I only remember for Bowman Wedge Boston made clear historians often debate whether we can learn from the past adequately or whether we can really repeat mistakes from the past. I would argue, though, that we can learn some lessons from the themes of the past. And we have spoken so far today about revolutions we have seen in the Arab world. It's worth remembering the etymology of the word revolution, where it was first used, in what circumstances. Those were the Italian city-states of the Renaissance, where you had rich, wealthy families ruling a city, feuding with each other, a family taking over from another family, amidst much bloodshed. And what you then had, or rather what one then had, was a change of ruling family. That was called a revolution because it accompanied a full cycle. And it came back to exactly where it started again. And the big fear we have, I think, in North Africa at the moment, is that what we are seeing is the blooming of potential but the return to the status quo. And that would be the greatest tragedy of all, in my view. Because what I think history has shown is that it is when autocracy is weakened, when the dictator takes their foot off the neck of the people he is oppressing, that not only is there the greatest opportunity for more freedom and democracy, but there is also the greatest risk that extremists will be able to use that opportunity to both flourish and gain legitimacy through the ballot box. I've been very pleased to hear people speak earlier in the debate about the importance of civil society. I noted one contributor saying that you couldn't create it from outside, but I do strongly believe that the greatest contribution the government can make to what is sadly occurring in North Africa and the Middle East at the moment is to do all it can to use its soft power to strengthen civil society. The Honourable Member for Mid-Sussex for Mid rather, was quite right when he pointed to the need for evolution over time. But equally, we were urged to raise our sights over and above Libya. I have to say that that is very difficult to do on a day when we hear of Benghazi being bombed, of a million inhabitants being threatened by who knows what Muhammad Gaddafi is going to unleash. When an autocrat is taking his foot off the gas, if, you like, if, if one likes. There seems to be almost a, a message from the international community that somehow now it is time to go. We saw that in Egypt, in Tunisia. When a dictator appears to be more implacable, as is the case in Libya, and dare I say it, Côte d'Ivoire also, they appear to manage to gain greater legitimacy, or indeed more staying power. The developed world ceases to take notice. Suddenly they become not on the front page, but on page two. Even of Le Monde, perhaps, of page 22 that I noted within the chamber earlier. So I think it's very important that when the international community sends a message, it remains resolute in that, and it does not diminish over time. I would also like to draw attention to a few points regarding what is occurring in Egypt. As someone who came to political maturity, if you can call it that, during 1989, I found it deeply, deeply inspirational to see people reclaiming democracy. As the Honourable Member for Birmingham Edge Boston pointed out, they had had a history of democracy and civil society in the past, and they were claiming it back. I found it deeply inspirational. But true democracy, true freedom, is not a matter of forming an orderly queue outside of a polling station to cast a vote. It is far, far greater than that. And what I want to ensure is that in Egypt we did not replicate what we saw in Gaza, which is the mechanisms of freedom, of an electoral process occurring, but that, that giving an opportunity to an organisation like Hamas 
to take power, exploit those opportunities, and actually misuse them. I thought the Honourable Member for Liverpool Riverside spoke eloquently and more than adequately about the true nature of Hamas. And I have no wish to repeat what she said because it was all entirely true. And I would rather we looked at Turkey, an example of where an Islamist party has been able to demonstrate its democratic credentials and in addition has also managed to minimise the role of the army. And my great concern in the case of Egypt is the immense strength that the army still retains, not merely in terms of a military power, but also an economic power, with fingers in so very many pies, even to owning tourist hotels and transport companies. The great danger in Egypt is that we will see a true Renaissance revolution, whereby in a few months' time we have gone through the cosmetic process of an electoral register and notionally free elections, but the same powers behind the throne remain in charge. That will not have been a democratic revolution. That will have merely have been a changing of the guard. I'm also greatly concerned of what the impact of events in Egypt will have on events in Israel. Because Israel, no matter what some may say in this chamber, remains in a very fragile strategic position. Um, compromise becomes ever harder to find in Israeli politics, in my view. We have spent a lot of time today discussing the impact of demographics on the unleashing of the Arab Spring, the combination of a very young population, a lack of economic growth, and that has conjured up a perfect storm, I think someone referred to it as. We see a similar perfect storm occurring in Israel, in my view, whereby we have a higher birth rate amongst the Orthodox community and amongst the Arab population in, in Israel, which is changing Israeli electoral dynamics. As the member for Warsaw North rightly pointed out, we have a very pure form of PR in Israel, which allows very small parties to get in on very small shares of the vote. And then it becomes extremely hard to actually build broad-based governments that are stable and durable and are committed to the cause of peace. I have a very great concern that as these demographic trends continue, the nature of Israeli politics will see the, the centre, the pro-peace centre, shrink, shrink and shrink, and it will become ever harder for the, for, the, for the great number in Israel who actually do want to see peace to actually prevail within their own political system. And I would urge the government, I know we don't like to interfere in in other people's electoral systems, but I strongly believe that until Israel addresses the stability of its governments, the chances of actually achieving a lasting and endurable peace are that much harder, in my view. Uh, yes, certainly. Thank you for giving way. I think he's making uh, a very admirable speech, and I'm supporting a lot of what he's got to say, and I think he makes an interesting point about the nature of Israeli politics and its influence on the peace process, but I just wonder if he would agree with me that perhaps if Israeli citizens had a greater sense of their own security, they might then choose to adopt candidates and governments who'd be more conducive to the peace process than what they may currently have at the moment. I think that is an interesting point. I, I think there's a wider one, though, which is that the nature of that electoral system gives a disproportionate amount of power to those who are more radical. And I think it's the, it, it's the influence they have rather than the amount of support they have that I think causes a problem in Israel. I would also like to make uh, one final point, which is perhaps the one I feel most passionate about. We have spoken about the importance in North Africa and the Middle East of inculcating democracy, of freedom, and the ability to live a free, harmonious, economically meaningful life. But that, I believe, is at risk for a very key and important group of people in that region. That is the Christian community. I have been deeply disturbed to learn of disquiet, bordering on violence in Cairo with the Coptic Christian community. I've been deeply concerned to learn of the murder of a Polish monk in Tunisia. It is vital during this period, the Honourable, the Honourable Member for Ilford South rightly pointed out, a lot of nasty things will creep out from under the stones of revolution. And I deeply, deeply hope that one of them is not more violence against Christian communities of whatever denomination. We've seen it happen in Algeria in the past. I do not want to see it happening across the Middle East as a whole. 
because if that region is to be successful in the way that the member for Penrith and the board have pointed out, then what we actually need is a deeper level of harmony in that region. And that means the ability of people of all faiths to get on, be they Jewish, Muslim or Christian. Because until those divides are healed, I really do fear that the Middle East will not take up its rightful role in the world today. It's worth bearing in mind that for many in Europe, they regard the Mediterranean as a border. It is worth bearing in mind that some of the finest Roman ruins in existence mm. are in Leptis Magna on the Libyan coast. That in Roman times, the Mediterranean was called Mare Nostrum, our sea. I really think it is important as someone who doesn't have much time for the EU, usually, to recognise the fact that in the Euromed process, and in what President Sarkozy has sought to do, it is vitally important that we do reach out to North Africa and see it as part of Europe and not just another continent that we don't wish to know about.